All right. Welcome everyone to the Urban Space Gallery and to the last Urban Affairs Forum of 2017 uh, organized by the TSA, the Toronto Society of Architects. My name is Megan Tortza. I'm a vice chair with the TSA and I'm really pleased that you all came, with, uh, came uh, to this talk tonight. So a few housekeeping uh, comments before I introduce our moderator and speakers this evening. Um, the TSA is a volunteer organization run by a board of volunteers, many of whom are here tonight, um, who are, their job is really to advocate uh, for architecture and, and appreciation of architecture in the city. Um, this talk tonight is eligible for two hours of structured learning for those of you who are uh, licensed architects. The key is, is that you've registered and you've signed in with myself, with Jocelyn, with one of the TSA reps who are here tonight. So if you've not been, if your ticket hasn't been scanned, please come see us afterward. That's the only way we'll get you a certificate. I also wanted to mention that this uh, event tonight is sponsored by LRI and we thank them for their ongoing sponsorship of, of the Urban Affairs Forum series over the last number of years. Their sponsorship allows us to rent this space. It allows us to provide some food and beverage for you. Um, so thanks to LRI for that. So tonight's topic is, is a really interesting and I think timely one for our city. Uh, and it relates directly to how we integrate and support public art in the city. The procurement of public art, the integration of public art when it's um, deemed to be appropriate, and especially how with the new methodologies of project delivery, specifically P3 projects, design build projects, how do architects and artists work together to really deliver high quality, integrated, thoughtful, inspiring public art in these kinds of big, bigger projects like hospitals and specifically tonight, many of the speakers will speak to transit corridors. We've put together a panel, I think, of, of some really interesting viewpoints on this topic. Um, and the panel includes uh, four speakers, each of whom will provide a short presentation, after which there'll be a Q&A um, where you'll be able to uh, ask them questions as well. So please keep your questions in mind for the, the, the later part of the discussion. So this evening's um, speakers include Laura Berazadi, who is the senior advisor for integrated art at Metrolinx. Laura develops and leads the new integrated public art program at Metrolinx and has previously worked for the public institutions such as Art Gallery of Ontario and the City of Toronto and has 30 years experience in the fine arts as a practitioner and a programmer. We also have Ana Francisca de la Mora from IBI. She is an architect and an associate at IBI Architects and for the past eight years her work has focused on large-scale transit architecture. She also has a background in the performing arts. She's a dancer, um, which adds a creative insight on her architectural practice. Paul Raff is here tonight. Paul is an architect, an artist, and a principal of Paul Raff Studio, a Toronto-based creative practice. And last but not least, we have our moderator, Brad Golden. I have to thank Brad and Ana Francisca especially for helping us to organize tonight's lecture. Brad has been involved in the creating and coordinating of public art projects for the last 35 years. First, as an artist, local projects include the Spadina Line, recipient of the Toronto Urban Design Award, and the Humber River Bicycle Pedestrian Bridge, recipient of multiple awards. And in 2006, Brad started providing public art consulting services to public and private sector clients, including the TTC and Metrolinx, as well as numerous private developer clients. So now I'll welcome Brad up to the podium, who will further introduce the topic this evening, provide his insights, as well as introduce the speakers. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, the intent of tonight uh, is not really to talk about some controversial issues in public art. We, we, can, we can maybe get into some of this, uh, some, some of the issues, if you will, uh, when we get into the question and answer. But the intent here uh, to an audience of architects and practitioners is to really discuss uh, some of the pr more practical aspects of delivering public art, uh, integrated public art specifically, and largely in transit-related uh, environments so that I can just get a, a sense of things, if you don't mind, and might be helpful to our, uh, our speakers as well. 
can you, with a, a brief show of hands, let me know if you are uh, working on public artwork projects that, uh, in an integrated nature at this time? Okay, so, so perfect, thank you. So, and the rest of you, I imagine, have, obviously have some interest in, uh, in, the, in the subject. So I think that this will be appropriate. I, I will, um, if, if at all possible, will will address specific issues, but I get a sense of, of where we're at here. So without further ado, as I mentioned before, uh, public art is a very, uh, a very interesting and sometimes provocative uh, subject matter. It involves public funds, uh, it involves public opinion, and there's discussions ranging everything from should public art be present, should it be paid with public dollars, and how is this delivered, what is the say of the public, and there are some uh, recently delivered projects, uh, two in Calgary, this one less so, and one here at home more recently, where there is inevitably uh, a very tantalizing discussion that takes place in the media, not the most sophisticated, but nonetheless, because there is such a, uh, an interest uh, broadly, we end up with, with um, a discussion uh, of some sort. Tonight is really not so much about uh, those aspects, but again, we can come back to that in the, uh, the Q&A. Tonight we're going to, I think I can't see this closely, so just allow me to do this. Tonight, as uh, Megan introduced, we have, uh, she's introduced the speakers. What I want to do is give you a sense of what, um, double I there, I can't do the automatic uh, corrections here. I can proof me in my own writing, but only when I see it here. So at any rate, Laura, Bar Laura Barazzati, she is going to um, introduce uh, an overview of the Metrolink's public art program. I think that might be interesting uh, to many here. Uh, and she's, um, she's also going to talk about what is called AFP, or Alternative Financing Procurement. We will not get into too much of the nuance of this, but it's a very important aspect now. It's, um, it's like, a, I guess you could say, an invasive species, an elephant in the room. But the way that public sector projects are delivered now is, really does have a significant impact on how public art, uh, and design for that matter, is delivered in a, in a, um, in a large infrastructure project. Uh, Laura's going to reference specifically Eglinton Crosstown, I imagine, as a, um, as a case study. Uh, Anna Francisca is, uh, is going to speak uh, to a number of specific projects as case studies for the delivery of integrated public art. Uh, using, uh, and she will be talking about what's called uh, design, bid, build, which is the, the old model. We're going to talk about this a little bit, uh, and P3. And then Paul Raff finally is going to talk, uh, deliver three of his projects. And they will be, again, case studies of integrated artworks delivered uh, delivered in, in, in transit, I believe. Thank you. I think it's important, uh, if we could, and this will be my, my role, is to provide an overview of some of the topics that the, uh, the different speakers are going to delve much uh, deeper into. I'm just going to give you the, the top line, kind of the, the basic glossary, if you will, of what we're going to talk about. There are, for the purpose of tonight, uh, and there are nuances, obviously, between those. There's, I wouldn't say that there's a real hard edge. There's probably a hard edge between standalone art and integrated art. But when we start talking about integrated art and applied art, I think there's a real nuance here that's worthy of discussion. And I, am, I imagine that that will uh, come out in discussion. So as, as examples of, of um, freestanding art, uh, much maligned, by the way, in the 70s and became um, known as, as plop art, uh, because people just felt that there was too, uh, not sufficient, if you will, integration with the architecture or its context. Now, um, example in Chicago, and uh, obviously a local example here, uh, certainly the local example, very controversy when, uh, controversial when initially installed, but now revered and has become uh, obviously uh, one of our uh, civic symbols, if you will. Uh, art is, th this discussion of art in architecture uh, is, is definitely not a new one. Um, I will, uh, I'll just let the, the slides speak for themselves, but we can look at, um, at the Erechtheon and we can look at Frank Lloyd Wright um, and the integration of art uh, therein. Architecture has, for many years, delivered content. How it delivers content and the meaning of it uh, has different nuances. And I, I, my, my thesis, and it's not, it's not that provocative, is really that as architecture removed content from the delivery in and of itself, public art became uh, that component of delivering content to public space and to architecture. And we'll, I think we'll see examples uh, of that locally 
uh, and, and tonight as well. These, sorry, these examples are more of what I would call um, applied art uh, as opposed to integrated art. And for purposes of tonight, and again, there is not a hard edge between the two of them. For me, a truly integrated art project, and this would be like the, you know, the, the king or the queen of, of delivery of truly integrated art, is when art and architecture uh, have a discussion, if you will, at the conception and delivery of the art, uh, of the architecture or the art, such that one is, the, the, the boundaries are blurred between the two of them. This is really, uh, I think, pretty rare, and it's more rare in this alternative finance procurement model that, um, that we're gonna be talking about. And I'll show you a few diagrams as to, as to why that is. So again, uh, integrated, yes, for sure. It's part of the expression of the architecture, but these are applied largely to surfaces. They are not necessarily the shaping of the space. Even, even in some um, wonderful examples uh, of, uh, of local transit architecture, on the left, it's, uh, if you don't know, this is being reinstalled. Uh, this is at uh, Yorkdale Station, Michael Hayden's Arc-en-Ciel, and um, it's Gregory Farmer, I think, is that right? Uh, Gregory Sutherland? James, James Sutherland at uh, DuPont Station. Per, per, uh, and I would say DuPont Station, as far as stations go, gets very close to a real integrated project where the actual form of the architecture is shaped, at least informed by the, uh, by the art. More locally, we have here uh, an example of the Toronto York uh, Spadina subway extension, TYSSE. It's a TTC project. These are the six new stations that are being uh, built and will be installed. I believe uh, open or commissioned in December. This will run from now the, the current end of the line at Downsview Station up to Vaughan Metropolitan Center. There are six new stations uh, whereby artists and architects work together uh, to deliver what I would say uh, truly integrated art. This is to say that the artists and the architects work together at the very inception of the space and develop the space together and then ultimately worked in their own separate um, uh, in their own areas of expertise in terms of producing drawings, but the final resolved space is, uh, is, is a real integration of art and architecture. So what are the issues here? The issues that happen when one makes a statement that uh, we don't want plop art, we do not want an object to sit and declare itself as art per se, but we want to rather integrate that into art, we want that to become part of architecture, there is a spectrum, if you will, or a slider, uh, of the registration or the primacy of the art object to the point where art can be subsumed uh, in terms of its expression, in terms of, of its dollars, uh, as architecture. When you deliver um, architecture that uh, is want, uh, then you look for other places to bring value back to that. And I was talking about content before. Uh, what happens sometimes uh, in a misappropriation of, or misinterpretation of what integrated art is is that you will have dollars being, uh, you'll have art dollars delivering architecture or landscape architecture. Uh, and then it becomes an issue of defining where those are and what the policing is. That's an, uh, um, an, an issue that I'd like to uh, just outline here. Uh, and then uh, I'm gonna address another issue uh, as far as delivery uh, goes, but we talked about design, bid, build. Uh, and then this has multiple uh, um, um, acronyms, PPP or P3, and then we have, uh, so that's uh, public-private partnerships. We have AFP, which is alternative finance procurement. And those can take uh, different forms. DBF, that's design, build, and finance. And then you have DBFM, design, build, finance, maintain. This is this uh, invasive species of delivery of projects, of uh, public projects, uh, often managed by the entity known as Infrastructure Ontario. Uh, and again, I, I will not deal directly with the, uh, or hopefully not break into a rant about the, di the difficulty of what that is attempting to do and how it doesn't do it. Uh, but I think it will come out in our discussion, and at least it will come out in, uh, in this discussion. Laura, how am I doing? Because, okay. Okay. I would like to just take a second here, only, and, and let you, just using this, I know it's, it's, this is actually a pretty simple m discussion of this because it gets pretty complex. But what's important to point out here as far as the delivery of art goes is that if we look at what we used to consider as a typical 
our traditional model, you would have um, this functional program, which is like the, how, how much space do we need? How many passengers do we need to move through the space? Uh, what times of day? Where is the back of house functions? Where is the public space functions? That's, that's defined and that's common for both models. But what would happen in the typical traditional model that many of us grew up with is that a consultant would be hired, uh, and an architect in this case, they would develop concept drawings with the client. Those concept drawings would then uh, be discussed. There would be um, iterations back and forth with the client. Uh, and then you would, once you've fixed that design, you would go into a working drawing uh, process where you're actually defining what is to be built. These are instructions to bidders. And then you have a competitive bid process where you take this set of drawings or instructions on how to build, build the thing. And you have multiple uh, prices back based on these drawings, based on the, the lowest bidder as well as other multiple criteria uh, of excellence, hopefully, you then award a contract. When you deliver artwork on, um, when you deliver artwork on this model, you can ideally get the artist involved at the concept drawings level. And when I was mentioning TYSSE, it was an example of the artist uh, participating at that very, very early stage. The next level that you could have at this, uh, and there's pros and cons there, which, which we will discuss as well. The next level that an artist might have been involved in in the traditional model would be in the working design. That is to say, before tender an award, uh, whereby the artist is finding a place, if you will, to occupy uh, within the spaces. And they would be delivering their art as part of the uh, working drawings. And then that would be sent out to multiple bidders. It's not that common in large infrastructure projects for artists. It is possible, but it's not that common for artists to uh, deliver their own work with their own hands uh, in a complex transit project. The risks are, are too great and the demands are in incredibly great. And there just isn't sufficient uh, insurance, frankly, to cover that. Uh, plus timelines and, and it, it is it's a very hot it, it can be a very hostile environment and it's just not a, a, it's not the best way to deliver the other way here the other way for an artist to be involved here is after post uh, tender and then figure out a way for them to in insinuate themselves in the space but nonetheless the opportunity exists in the traditional model for an artist to get involved very early in the process the challenge with AFP when we go to the bottom model and I do believe this will be talked about with our speakers tonight, is that you have your functional program, which I mentioned before, passenger load, et cetera. And then you have this, this thing called um, performance output specifications, which sometimes involves uh, developing a, uh, a reference design. You actually hire uh, an architect, you spend millions of dollars, you design something to 10 or 30% of the design. And then you take that design, which shows the intent of what you're trying to do, and you send that out to multiple uh, bidders. And they are paid a um, sum of money to come back and they deliver a total complete package. Artist is still not typically involved, typically not involved yet. You have a winner, a winning bidder, often determined by price, always determined by price. And then, and then, you, have, and then you figure out a way to involve the artist. It's challenging, it comes much later in the process. So I'm going to leave that for now, but I do want to flag that there is really a different, uh, the way that you procure projects really has an effect on delivering excellence, design excellence and, and art. So the question is, I'm, making it, I'm, I'm suggesting that the best way to proceed is to get an artist in early, uh, as early as possible, because then you have a, you know, the, the, the most significant effect of, an art, uh, of the art I do believe that there are challenges and they have to do, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that as well, but I'm suggesting there are issues and tropes, if you will, with getting an artist involved too early. So I think with that, having, um, having defined uh, the, uh, the different types of art through the glossary, if you will, the standalone, the um, integrated and the applied, and also defined these different models of delivery, uh, I think it's time to Stop listening to me and introduce Laura to, to speak. So thank you. Am I the only non-architect in the room tonight? <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. Okay. So um, 
I'm actually working with Brad on a Metrolinx project in the Junction Triangle right now called the Davenport Diamond. Um, it's a very high profile project of an elevated bridge guideway system with public realm components. I'm not going to talk about that project tonight. Um, but as a result of that working relationship, he invited me to come in and introduce the integrated public art program that Metrolinx has um, since 2016. Um, this was a program that was developed specifically for AFP or P3. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is really just give you an overview of guiding principles, approach that we like to take, and then I'm going to look at a pilot project. So. Metrolinx is increasingly a public player in shaping the form and quality of the civic realm that accompanies regional transit infrastructure. Um, Metrolinx is currently involved in tens of billions of dollars of public capital infrastructure projects um, that are going to be rolling out over the next five to 25 years. Um, currently, I am working on uh, 15 artwork projects that are funded and confirmed. Uh, that represents about 30 different artwork sites and budgets of 25 million currently. That's likely to double in the next couple of years. One of the things that I was asked to do two years ago when the Eglinton Crosstown was in early stage development was come in and write a policy for them. Uh, they'd had a technical advisory team uh, write the project specific output specifications for how the artwork was going to work in that AFP project. So they had a framework in place that worked pretty well, um, but they needed some reinforcement and they wanted to make sure that all the details were taken care of and there was going to be flow through afterwards. So that was my initial introduction to Metrolinx. Um, Metrolinx's policy uh, was approved and started to take place uh, about a year ago. Um, Metrolinx's integrated art program has a mandate to build a cohesive public art collection that is regional in scale and representative of the best of contemporary artwork. Uh, it's mandatory on Metrolinx capital projects are over $10 million total project cost. The guideline is 1% of eligible hard construction costs. So it's not a true 1% of project, it's the public facing element. So we exclude things like tunneling, track work, environmental assessments, soft costs, etc. And all of the hard costs that go into the public facing infrastructure we use as a 1% guideline. Again, the artwork must be permanent and integrated. And as the owner, Metrolinx is responsible for the artwork conservation, so maintaining it over time. We take a life cycle of 30 years, but we anticipate these works are going to be part of the built form for 50 years or more. Um, so putting aside funds to take care of that and having a process in place is also important. Now, this may be familiar to many of you, but um, I wanted to define what we meant by integrated art because sometimes that's a question that comes up. So for Metrolinx, we define integrated art as the product of a creative process that's led by professional artists with skills in artistic discipline and active art practice, peer recognition, and a history of public presentations. Uh, that's a common definition. Canada Council uses it, so do many other agencies. Integrated art goes above and beyond the base expression of a building or open space with the explicit purpose of artistic expression. Uh, that means it's not an architectural feature or a design element, strictly. It replaces or is integrated with standard faci facility finishes or fixtures, and it's permanent. Here are some examples of different uh, integrated art forms. So um, th these are a range of projects that are from around the world. Um, there's a plaza in one, a parking structure at the bottom left, cladding, uh, a few metro stations, public realm under an underpass, fencing, digital media. Um, I also get asked what integrated art is not. Um, this might be self-evident, but it's not freestanding, it's not temporary, um, and it's again not uh, design elements. One of the things that we think about in early stage when we're defining an approach is the criteria for selecting art locations. Um, and this can vary. So we think about questions like, is there a single site or multiple sites along a transit corridor or a site with multiple buildings or other structural elements? Will there be a single artwork or multiple artworks conceived? What is the scale? What is the budget? What is the quality of response from artists expected given the scale, budget, and location? Uh, Metrolinx considers that it's desirable that the artwork location has a defined purpose and role within the overall project and that the artwork features prominently and is consistent with program objectives. Some guidelines include choosing locations with high impact. For us, that means multimodal stations, important civic spaces, locations at view corridors or with good sight lines. It's also really important to avoid conflicts. So locations that detract from the artwork experience because of advertising, retail, signage, mechanical apparatus, 
anticipated future work, safety operational requirements, or code requirements. Um, so often when we're looking at a project at early stages, we have the reference concept design, we have a sense of what the budget is and what the procurement method is, and we start thinking about um, the strategy for artwork and how it will be included. So this is a different form of the, um, the models that uh, uh, were shown earlier. Above is a traditional model like a design bid build and below is an AFP or P3 project. Um, if you'll see in kind of the pink or red, um, that's where the uh, artwork development process comes in. So in a traditional model or design bid build, it happens prior to tender or before the in-market period. And again, that's opportunity to work directly with the uh, architecture and design team to develop a concept and have it fairly locked in by the time it goes to the constructor to bid on. In AFP, it's a bit different. Um, we start with that functional program reference concept design, which is essentially treated just as proof of concept. And and also PISO, so those are the technical requirements that form the project agreement in place and become our guiding document and the only thing that you can hold the constructor to. Um, so typically what we do at this stage is we have a general strategy or approach in mind that may or may not be reflected in the reference concept design. Um, we do have strict requirements that are included in PISOS. Uh, we also include compliance criteria. So as the project progresses and construction is underway, there are submissions, um, design development submissions, and we can sort of track the project and see whether they're actually adhering to the requirements for the artwork and that we can make sure that it's on schedule and it's not being deferred. After, after there's an executed project agreement and we have a project co on board, usually we like to have a kickoff meeting with the architectural and design team. Um, that's to talk about roles and responsibilities, requirement vis-a-vis -vis the artwork program, and have them develop an approach. Usually that may mean selecting locations that are aligned with our guidelines developing technical specifications and assisting us in writing what is like a mini RFP for the artist to respond to. Uh, we go through an artwork concept development phase and evaluation by an external advisory panel, selection process, contracting, and then we hand the artist that's been selected by Metrolinx and the artwork concept design along with material specifications, detailed design, budget attached to the constructor. And oftentimes in AFP, it's the constructor who will actually subcontract the artist. So they have the contractual relationship and they go through the detailed design, um, fabrication and installation of the final work. And at that point, Metrolinx is simply um, in a reviewer capacity. This kind of uh, speaks to that in a different way in terms of roles and responsibilities through the planning phase, the evaluation and selection phase, implementation, and then maintenance. Um, the key things to note here is that the owner, which is Metrolinx, is the one who sets the competition criteria and selects the artisan artwork concept designs. And it's Projectco who does a feasibility and technical review of artwork concept designs, basically defines an approach, and then uh, is responsible for producing and installing the artworks in the end. So I wanted to, to talk just briefly about uh, a pilot project for this program, which was the Eglinton Crosstown LRT. Uh, this is a project that's currently under construction in Toronto. You've probably heard some things about it. Uh, scheduled to open in 2021. Um, little bit of background, so this is part of a first wave of projects. Um, the Eglinton Crosstown LRT is 19 kilometers in length. It runs from uh, Weston to uh, Kennedy uh, across Eglinton. It has 10 kilometers of underground portion between Keel and Laird, and it's going to have 15 underground stations and 10 accrade stops in total. Um, so one of the things that we asked as part of the bid submission is for the uh, project co to define an approach or a strategy for including artwork across the 19 kilometers, and right away they ruled out the accrade stops. So that basically took out half of the line. Um, and our response to that was to look at the intermodal stations. It made sense to take out the accurate stops because the infrastructure is quite limited um, and there's a number of different signage and other operational concerns to, to worry about. Um, so we looked at the intermodal stations and we thought, okay, there's six of those. They're fairly equitably distributed across the line and there's a lot of opportunities and, and different types of spaces where artists could respond to. Um, 
one of the things that the uh, the constructor started by doing was identifying kind of available areas that had no conflicts associated with them. I'm not able to show you many images from this project because they're mostly confidential, but I have just a couple to give you a sense of how the project developed. So this is Eglinton Station. I'm going to look at Eglinton Station and Kennedy Station. Uh, Eglinton Station and Eglinton Young, if you're familiar, you go down from street level down to a lower level concourse uh, where there's also a bus terminal underground, then you descend again to the subway. This is an incredibly deep station, so the LRT is going to descend lower than that and has a concourse level and then platform level. Um, it's very tightly constrained because of all the different um, uh, buildings and utilities around that area. Um, and this is over also an overbuilt site. Uh, so there were very limited opportunities and at first the constructor came back and said okay you have these two walls right it's kind of an applied approach here are these two walls and we asked them to kind of take another stab at it and we developed this approach on this project with them where we color coded the entire site so this drawing was part of a, a much larger package of drawings and renderings that the artist received and what we did is green meant a preferred location for artwork free of conflicts Yellow meant a possible location with conflicts. Usually that meant signage and lighting, but there could be other uh, conflicts in those areas. And red meant prohibited, absolutely no go. That was mainly at platform level and some other locations. Retail also was off the table. So they, they received a package, it was like an RFP with submittals and requirements, a set of drawings and renderings, uh, context about the site, and then they came back with their concepts. This was the winning concept for this site. Um, the artist is Rodney Latourell, and um, his initial concept was essentially, it's, a, it's a, a, a sculptural wall treatment that projects out of the wall. It has four different types of mirrored and dichroic glass and it's backlit by LEDs. Um, originally it weighed 18 tons, but then because of changes <laughs> Because of um, changes, because this is actually above platform level, so there's, um, there's air vents and a lot of air circulation. Um, so after we submitted this, technical comments came back, which required a re-engineering of this project, and now I think the weight has doubled. It's over 30 tons. And it, it has a, um, a catwalk behind it to access the lighting. Um, and so we had to do a lot of, well, not we, the artist <laughs> and his engineers had to do a lot of structural work to make it work. Um, but uh, the project team really liked this response because in particular it was picking up on the lead architect for design excellence thoughts about bringing light down into the station. And this is a common theme in the artworks that were selected across the line. They're all different artists and they're all different artworks, but they tend to respond to the same themes. Um, so this is one project. The other one I wanted to talk about was Kennedy Station. The two terminus stations we had um, essentially a main artwork site for a senior artist and then we had a secondary site for what we've called a mentor candidate artist. And that's just a term we're using. The artists are not actually mentored, they're just emerging artists who um, haven't previously worked on a construction project of this scale. So they're unproven. And what we did is we gave them very limited locations with budgets of $250,000 to respond to. Um, the average budget for our works on the other stations, the main locations were a million dollars per site. Um, so at Kennedy Station, the secondary location was a pedestrian corridor. Um, as you can see here, uh, the architects didn't do a whole lot to give us renderings for these locations. They just identified them. So we had them mainly in drawing. And this is a younger artist called Dagmar Agenda. And again, she worked with the idea of light. And what she wanted to do is use all of the available infrastructure in this location. So she used the skylight. Um, and she also created a series of light boxes to go along the corridor. Um, we thought this was a really thoughtful um, approach to this location. Um, it's visible from within the station, but also outside at grade where there's a plaza and some planted areas. Um, it changes, uh, your experience changes depending on whether you see it at day or at nighttime, um, but it's a constant. Um, and uh, she really rose to the challenge. So that sort of brings me to the end of the images, and I'm probably out of time. Yeah. Um, I'd like to save some additional commentary for the Q&A, but um, essentially, as you can see with this AFP process, because the artist concept develop gets happens later on in the process, um, the locations that we tend to get and the approach that we tend to get, um, due to a number of technical reasons, is more of an applied approach as opposed to an integrated approach. Um, and that's something that we're finding consistently. So thinking about that as we kind of go forward.
Thank you. Thank you for the TSA for um, allowing us to come and do this panel. My objective of, of what I'm going to talk is uh, the experience of an architect's point of view when working with an artist. And it will be for two projects, a DBB and a P3. I'll be two case studies, Finch West Station and Auto LRT. With Finch West, I had a direct experience. Uh, uh, with Auto One, not as much, but I have colleagues, Danielle and Neil from IBI, and maybe at the Q&A, we'll refer to them for any specific questions. Yes? Sure, is that better? Yes, that's better, okay. So, I, I've no, we've shown plenty of diagrams. This is just going quickly. Uh, very, very simplifying the process of a project where design and construction, looking at DBB, the artist comes around 10% and it becomes part of the team, of the project team. On a P3 process, it comes after the 60% milestone, um, around 70%, and it works in parallel with the design team. And this is what happens specific with the two examples I'm going to be uh, presenting. So Finch West Station, it's a DBB project. We did it in, in um, joint venture with Lee and Halsell and the architecture in joint venture with Will Alsop in the UK. I just have to acknowledge that thanks for the TYSSE for allowing us to show these images very um, specific to the project. So we have uh, two lead architects, Richard Stevens from IBI, Will Alsop that I mentioned and Bruce McLean who's an artist also from the UK. He was uh, selected, uh, Brad was the art consultant, and Will and Alsop had a previous relationship which also helped a lot for uh, the, the collaboration. Fintra Station is uh, no, just the line that extends north of Shepherd West. So we did two stations. The one I'm talking is the one further south. It's just one before York University. You probably are familiar with these are coming up on all the subway. I can't wait for these stations to open. They're gonna be magnificent and they'll open in other parts of the city. Uh, transit stations are portals to another part of the city. So going through this project, one big part of the programming of a station is the substation. It's what gives power to the trains. And there are big pieces, and this case is a purple. So this is big purple box, and it's hard to animate. So TTC did not want it underground as they typically do because of leakage. And the city, we were putting it back there, and, and, and it's just, it was just not working, especially for what the public realm. So we decide, okay, it's not down, it's not on the first, oh, we'll just float it up in the air. Um, we call it the flying beam. Of course, the engineer said, well, you're gonna need some columns for your flying beam. Um, and that, also that's when Bruce McLean started to collaborate and said, let's have it, why don't we have Greek caryatids to hold this flying beam hovering, uh, that will hover through this public space linking the bus terminal and the street. So I couldn't wait to see what faces we would put in these Greek caryatids. So things go back and forth. You can see how it was represented on a, as a red and, and sketches start to go back and forth. We were talking of a family of objects that would hold this together. And it, it was very exciting to, he, he took this on to start um, modeling what was gonna happen. Maybe possibility of some benches aside from the column. So uh, not only this flying beam, but also the supporting elements and the engineers getting involved in it. So, and what the message he was telling us is that he wanted to be invisible. He wanted to be as integrated to the architecture and engineering as possible. So this is him, as you can see probably in the promotional. Um, at first there were steel blades that would hold this uh, big piece um, up in the air. Uh, TTC wasn't comfortable of the possibility of a bus maybe crashing. So then uh, it evolved to be three-dimensional sculptures uh, in concrete. So back and forth with sketches and uh, it's very refreshing when you're dealing with so many standards and functional things uh, from, from these programming, having this refreshing voice in the team. So you can see this is this long piece is uh, the bus canopy, which he um, sculpted. 
and uh, one of the engineering drawings, which I also consider a piece of art from Lee Consulting, of all the rebar to have these columns. And then he further collaborated with us for the selection of some color. And this is one of the final renderings, uh, that pink boxes, that flying beam, and the bottom floor that gives that transparency and very public for the bus terminal. And this is in construction, incredible pieces. The underground, he extended his works to the underground. We have these big pieces of these boxes underground, and uh, uh, we had that intermediate column. So he took it upon himself and also sculpting, inspired by these uh, columns, 6,000 year, years old, south of Spain, Minorcan columns. And he was saying, well, I want to make use of ancient times in modern times. And working also all the intricacies of ceiling and the lights, and uh, the, they have to be very robust. They, they have to uh, withstand vandalism. And this is all coming together um, in, in inside space, and it's a double height space. And this is in construction, and it just uh, doesn't have that top lid, and you can appreciate that. So imagine um, users being able to look up and appreciate these, these uh, masses. Then another, the second case, the Auto LRT, a P3 project, different. It's a very big joint venture. Uh, this uh, LRT is a 12-kilometer route and 13 stations. IBI scope are the three underground stations. So these stations are integrated into existing or future development. There are two phases, or let's say two separate, um, uh, I guess, phase, uh, uh, methods on how they dealt with public artists in, in this case. They call it integrated and non-integrated. And this is on their own definition. Um, the artist worked integrated, and, and his uh, work will be integrated into the issue for construction drawings, and is working with the architect. And the non-integrated, it's a standalone, and it will be after being constructed. The phase one, the integrated, for instance, for this station, Lyon Station, Jeff, Jeff McFetridge was selected. He was introduced to the architect, well, us, and uh, he wanted to paint the walls. So we gave them the options, which options were for him to use the walls, similar to what Laura was talking about. We facilitated these drawings, and he took it, I, I believe he took uh, almost all of them, and he's doing this fantastic um, life-size, or more than life-size uh, paintings all along the walls. <laughs> right? It's uh, incredible to have your daily commute entertainment. So this is an, an underground station, Rideau Station. We make a point of always having double height spaces to make feel people connected in this underground world. And this artist was um, Genevieve Cadio, wanted to use glazing. Initially, she wanted to use at grade, but we suggested this glazing that is separating the concourse level and connecting it to the underground train experience, the platform train experience. So these are some of the drawings. She's creating that translucency and using that. And of course, when the artist comes through with proposals like this, we, we, are, we have to work with them in terms of uh, the septed, which is a crime prevention environmental, environmental design. So to make sure that uh, they're still compliant with all those standards for transit. And these, uh, the details on the left, she developed to make sure that the glazing was up to her standards. It's a lot of work for the artist after the proposal to make sure that it, it complies with all the different needs. And then the non-integrated, these are the standalone. This is Jennifer Steed from Parliament Station. Her proposal is to um, have these laser cut floral motifs in between the two tracks. 
So some of the detail that comes in, there's strong winds for the train when they come in and out, called the piston effect. And these, um, well, she has to make sure they are robust enough for, for this, and also the power washing. This is another project by Plant Architects. They are from Toronto. And uh, you can see at the bottom, they are proposing that this uh, wall, they're honoring the women who um, archived a lot of information that when the transition of Bytown to Ottawa. I mean, what a great way to pass to newcomers history when you're passing by and you can read a phrase, you can understand something more about where you live. For instance, they had to raise a bit of the wall to make sure people would see, make it as transparent as possible. So some final thoughts. In DBB, in Finch West, you observe that the, char the artists challenge the architectural and the engineering team in the design process. However, there's an added cost. It took a lot of time on drawing. I mean, added, it's just, it was a pleasure for us, but uh, there was more time on drawing. Uh, the artist was able to go down to London to will with the Will Alsop and stand side by side the rendering, uh, the modeling artist, the modeling, um, I guess a modeling artist, of course. The successful integration relies on a good relationship. The artist has more direct participation, has more information, has, so there's less stress. Not that there's no stress, but there's, hopefully there's less. Um, for the Ottawa LRT, the artist is detached from the architectural and the design process. Uh, the communication is through a third party. We try our best to give as much, but it's, it's more detached. He comes later in the design, and the less, less cost, the artist has its own budget. For instance, however, there's advantages, like the artist is choosing the walls. That wall was all going to be tile. So once the tile is removed, that artist gets that credit. So lessons learned from an architect's point of view, very in brief. Well, as an architect, you have to be open and flexible to the design input from an artist. You have to assign a key person, a champion in your team to support the artist and inspire the cooperation. Someone that is constantly being able to explain to the artist the context of the project. Define the scope and the area very clearly of where the artist is participating. And communication, again, is giving the full understanding of the project environment. So final thought, it's worth it. It's add values to the end user's experience. Transit facilities are so important in our days. It, uh, it unites us as, as a city. So why not add even more? Thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, I'm just gonna sh briefly show three of my fairly recent projects as sort of case studies in, um, in this idea of integrated public artwork into various projects working with design teams. Um, I would say they vary in degrees of integration um, from um, somewhat integrated to more into, mo quite to very integrated as we go through them, the three of them successively. Uh, the first one's called, called Mirage. Uh, it's a built work in Toronto. It's um, at Underpass Park. This was the site before the park was built. Um, and this was the um, uh, context for both the landscape architect um, and uh, um, my work as the artist. This is the eventual park. It's a vibrant urban park if you've ever been there in the Underpass area, PFS with uh, planning partnership. Um, and much of this existed in drawings when I first came on board in what looked to me like a pretty well-developed um, design by the very good landscape uh, architects. And um, uh, although it did change considerably uh, during the process in a way that was unpredictable, and that was one of the challenges of integrating uh, with the process. So um, my concept um, had to do is that kind of um, uh, blue figure it's a, a sort of overhead single plane of an array of reflective panels in a sort of um, like a kind of flattened mechanical cloud form, I call it. Um, and it, it's a low relief sculpture hung from the underside of the overpass 
Um, the idea is that it graphs both light and view onto the underside of the deck. Um, it creates um, reflections and therefore um, um, sort of um, intensified and varied kind of view corridors through from one neighborhood to another, which are sort of um, uh, bisected by this huge kind of powerful piece of modern infrastructure. Um, it uh, embodies um, a lot of sort of passive kinetic potential. Um, it's a key strategy in almost all of my work where um, the movement of your own body transforms what you're seeing, the movement of other people um, upside down um, um, are transformed, transform what you're seeing. Um, and then in itself, it has a variation um, in the scale and the pattern of the panels so that in itself, it has a sort of um, very gentle uh, rhythmic transform, tra uh, transition um, across it. So it's a, it's a low relief reflective sculpture. Um, this is it at the opening day. Can you, everyone hear me okay? Yeah. And this is it sort of reflecting upwardly the kind of powerful um, modern context. So one of the um, things that differentiates this project from the other two in terms of um, uh, 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 the process and the kind of contractual context of the work is that as the artist, I was um, not only designed, but I fabricated and delivered and installed this work, uh, which is different from a lot of other artworks that I've been involved in. Um, where our um, work gets embodied in a, basically a set of tender drawings um, and goes into that kind of public tender process, which has its own challenges. Um, one of the problems uh, with integrating into a whole uh, project um, and process is that um, uh, I had a tremendous challenge trying to get permission to hang these, um, this array of steel reflectors off the underside of this bridge uh, the transportation department or whoever has jurisdiction over it had very reasonable um, concerns about public safety and maintenance issues. Um, in the, after about a year and a half, I was giving up and I went back to the drawing board and reconceived of a different ground-based work. Um, I got the landscape architect design team back on the phone. They were open-minded as they had been the first time. They were receptive. They were thoughtful. They were articulate with their feedback. These are all um, important um, um, characteristics of their involvement and, and the other teams I'm going to talk about in the next two works, uh, which contributed to the success of the work and, um, and to which I benefited uh, um, um, in my process uh, um, from, from that characteristic of them. But when I presented the ground-based work, they were open to it, but the truth is virtually no one else was. The client based team, which was huge, had sort of psychologically moved on and they were married to this concept. And so I was a little bit caught in a process um, where they wouldn't approve me changing it, but I couldn't get approval for it getting built. Anyway, as you can see, I did get approval for it getting built and uh, that um, collision uh, resolved itself, thankfully, because I don't know what would have happened otherwise. Um, the next one is the Lower Don Valley Art Fence, um, working with um, the landscape architects, architects and excellent multidisciplinary design team, some of whom are in the room today from DITA. Um, um, there are a whole, there's a whole suite of improvements, we, the, the word people use, uh, to, the, to the Don Valley that's being planned, um, to the softscaping, to the hardscaping, this path, which is um, a very well-traveled bicycle and pedestrian route, is going to be um, um, made better, made wider. Um, and I was brought on specifically, or an artist was brought on, in this case me, um, to, for the reconstruction of this fence, which plays pretty much the singular role of stopping people, and I suppose dogs, and I'm not sure what else, from, um, from walking into the train corridor, a highly active train corridor. Um, so it, it's a long fence, it's very, very long, and it was a sort of what they call a delta. So there was already a budget for the fence and there was a budget for the artwork, and whatever I did to the fence that increased um, the, the budget of the fence was the budget for the artwork, if you know what I mean. Um, it's really easy to go over budget when you're trying to spread dollars across seven kilometers or whatever length this was, if you know the map. I mean, it's across you know, a whole swath from the kind of bottom of the Lower Don Valley Trail up to kind of Riverdale Park. Um, the, um, the design team had planned to use this handsome, robust, 
utilitarian, you know, handsome to a degree, uh, fence. Um, that was what was uh, budgeted for, that was what was planned for. Um, and artistically, um, I felt rather strongly um, that the Don Valley is so rich in its experience, in its um, uh, history, in its iconography, so rich in its imagery that the wrong thing to do as an artist would be to try and necessarily bring new imagery to it. Um, but I felt like my role was rather um, to help um, frame a new and make as resonant as possible uh, existing imagery of this visually rich part of our metropolis. Um, I didn't have a lot of room to maneuver. I was told I was not into encro encroach into the railway corridor, and I was not into encroach into the bike path. So as much as I love doing low relief sculptures, here I really had no choice. This was going to be low relief. It was going to be a very, very thin work. Um, so it's as thin as the fence, more or less. This is what the fence looks like as a diagram. You can see the posts, you know, every whatever they are, uh, two meters or something like that. And then the uh, prefabricated uh, panel grid of galvanized steel or galvanized and painted steel. I got the idea to put the fence on both sides and layer it up in between and create um, this kind of dense fabric out of the fence. And then to carve it away um, into a kind of pattern um, that would shift as you walk by it and that could shift according to its length. So the way we um, did it actually um, it was very intense at the two ends of the fence, um, but then sort of gradually um, the um, uh, openings in it became more elongated and the layers became less. I think there were five layers and then four and so on, and it sort of disappeared into the fence and then reappeared at the other end. So it's part of this um, uh, linear time-based experience of going down the path. Um, these are um, some studies in interference patterns from our early computer models. And this is a sketch showing that kind of idea of the kind of intense cadences at either end and a kind of crescendo in the middle. And then this is an elevation of a moment where it's going from its more intense layers and then starting to elongate out. And this is a perspective view of what it looks like. The interesting thing is that um, when you look at it in pure elevation, the actual, um, uh, it's, um, it's a double ellipse, um, a double uh, sine wave geometry um, actually disappears and you actually only see it on an angle. And it's interesting because as a person mostly bicycling or running, it's really well used by cyclists, um, you experience it a lot. And so the kind of dynamism of moving and that kind of passive kinetic experience was very much a part of it. Um, in this case, one of um, the biggest challenges of the project um, did have to do with the tendering project uh, process. I was a little new to having to do artworks that way. I was used to the kind of fabrication and build it yourself, artist hands on or work closely with the, in the with the fabricator's method. Um, and it was rather difficult to get the fence supplier um, to sort of design and engineer all the idiosyncrasies and iterations in the incredible schedule pressure. Um, that, that the project was under at the time. Um, I think there was also some uh, learning with the um, DITA design team about where our scope was going to end and there's begin in the drawings because it was so integrated. Um, what probably started out as what's normally like two or three drawing sheets in a set became you know, quite a bit more with huge complex tables in order to describe all the conditions of this uh, seven kilometer long or whatever it is um, fence. The final one I'm going to show, it's called Atmospheric Lens. Um, it's also along the new subway line. It's the terminus station in Vaughan. Uh, I worked with um, Grimshaw Architects and have continued to this day, um, many years later, to work with um, Adamson and Associates on its realization. Um, most of the, this very large station is underground. This is an above ground portion as visualized by Grimshaw Architects. They conceived of this uh, kind of dome shape and um, I got the idea, a bit like Mirage, it, to use um, the optics of reflection in, a, in an array of repeating panels, only because it's on the inside of a dome, 
I've decided to follow in a very long, important artistic tradition of treating the underside of a dome and that kind of int artistic integration with architecture. Um, it turned out to be sort of more like, this is, a, by the way, a little um, mock-up I made in my studio just a few blocks from here, um, to be sort of like an inside-out mirror ball or disco ball where um, uh, um, each reflection is sort of of the same view, but slightly different. So it's a bit more of a kind of cubist collage, a kind of kinetic cubic collage, where you know if you see someone sort of carrying their bags, briefcase home from work, upside down in the part of the station reflected here, they suddenly sort of jump. You know, there's a time delay and a different angle when they go from one mirror to another in the reflection overhead. So. I have done all sorts of tests to um, try and figure out what that is going to look like. And the truth is, I haven't seen the final thing. It's just being completed right now. I'll be there in a couple weeks, and we'll see if it worked. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is the um, perspective view of the inside. Um, so it's, uh, there are, I think, four types of panels on the ceiling. There's the highly reflective. There's the much more diffuse ones. Um, and uh, before I forget, I want to say one of the most remarkable days um, in this process was when I went to Grimshaw's New York office for the briefing, and there were 15 people in the room, and none of them were just there to take notes. All of them were an integral part of the briefing. Every key engineer on the team, mechanical, fire and life safety, lighting, acoustic, every single one there, and all five of the architects from the architecture team there for just over two hours to brief me. Now, any of you who are principals in architecture firms are probably doing the math about how much that meeting cost them uh, in salaries alone. Um, it was money well spent because everything was on the table in the very first meeting. I knew who to talk to. I knew what the concerns were. Everyone knew how to communicate with each other, um, and I would call that exemplary. Um, so this is emerging up in, you can't really see the artwork from here. Um, part of the idea was, um, I have a kind of obsession with the degree to which architecture actually just kind of divorces us from the atmosphere and the world around us. Um, and this dome, you know, in a subway station where you're already spending much of your kind of commute and experience a bit divorced from light, sky, wind, atmospheric conditions. Um, and so I wanted to um, take that on and make this a kind of lens. And so some of it has to do with the reflections, where the reflections collage and create their own atmosphere out of the um, kinetic dynamics of the life within the station. And some of them have to do with actually um, an array of skylights designed specifically for certain sun angles to try to capture moments of light. I'm another artist who's trying to like, think about natural light in penetrating a station. Um, and so the treatment of the dome wasn't just with reflectors across this surface. Actually, the vertical or angled surfaces of the skylight upturns or coffers um, have chromated reflectors. So they uh, frame the view of the sky reflected, intensify it with certain colors, and bounce that reflected color down to the ground, to the floors of the station. What's that? Yeah. So that ended up with a um, very irregular pattern of skylights based on the sun angles, which I think was quite a departure for the architects and quite an enrichment visually to their um, station. And I'll just quickly zoom through it because I'm out of time, but different perspectival studies. And I will leave it at that. Thank you. I made the case earlier that, that it's good, it's ideal to have an artist uh, participate in the design team as early as possible. That there are advantages to have the full, full flavor, if you will, of, of the artist uh, mind and the artist uh, work becoming part and part of the architecture. So inevitably when we, when we work towards something, we create these tropes, if you will, like there's something that happens as a, as a result of bringing an artist in. From your perspective, uh, are, there, are there issues or something that might actually say that maybe it's not so great to have an artist in, in earlier? Well, procurement issues to start. Um, as most of the projects we work on are AFP, 
uh, the early stage actually doesn't have the project co. Like we don't know who they're going to be or what they're going to do yet. Um, we're doing reference concept design and requirements. So that is too early, in my opinion, to bring the artist on board um, because you don't have anything for them to latch on to. Even the RCD um, may or may not exist in the form that we're looking at it. Like the renderings that are done, they get modified a lot through the process. Um, so we tend to introduce artists at about 30% detailed design with Project Co on board, which, and that's usually when they get sort of stage of drawings, they get information about the project and they begin to develop their concept in parallel as you were talking about. I think there have already been some um, clear advantages identified to bringing the artist on board early. I think uh, um, uh, there are a couple of disadvantages. A disadvantage is frankly just momentum. These projects take a long time. Um, you know, in the case of that station, I've been working on it for more than six years, I think. Um, and then I think I also talked a little bit about when, when schedules and approvals and things get out of sync. Um, if the artist starts working and then something in the design is going to change a lot, it can um, th uh, th throw them off and um, they have to kind of, you know, crumple up their process and s sort of do a rethink. So um, the, advantages, the, the advantages are great, the disadvantages are um, um, fewer, but those are a couple of them. Uh, and Anna Francisca, you did um, uh, you did allude to uh, increased costs and complexity in the design process of having that artist in early. Um, and you've also worked, with your colleagues here have worked um, in, in the other role when the artist comes in later. Do you want to speak a little bit to uh, any or elaborate a little bit on the complexity of incorporating an artist design early in the process? Yeah. I mean, the integration on a traditional or DBB project. Um, it's it can be fantastic but also it can be very frustrating especially because the process is longer uh, the expectations are higher for the artist as well um, the drawing time um, is just increased and i have to say at the end there were concerns about the money we were investing and the engineers there was uh, an extension we had to do to the bus canopy and that was hard on 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 us and and on him as well but um, for now, for transit projects, the, the new reality is they are P3, at least for the next little while. And uh, once it goes, it's awarded, the project is, even though it's at 30%, it's quite, it, it's a very robust 30%. So the artist is, in a way, when, when they come in, their work can be more effective because there aren't going to be um, there are going to be a lot. Uh, there are going to be a lot of changes, but not too significant in, in the sense that they will crumple and have to start from scratch, which happened on Finch West. So that that is um, one of the things that uh, the advantages and disadvantages that you can see. So I, I'll, I'll add from my perspective, if I might, that the, there is, for sure, there's increased risk. Uh, with the artist on board earlier, not the risk of the artist, but the risk of, the, of not knowing where things are going to go. Uh, that is to say that when you um, present a wall or a surface or a limited scope, uh, you are defining or drawing a fence, if you will, around where that artist is going to go and you are limiting risk in that regard and risk is money and risk is uh, uh, time. So uh, there's another little trope um, that, I, that, that I've found and that is that when you bring an artist on early in a process, you are actually uh, you're limiting to a certain degree or you are biasing. Let's say you're biasing uh, the response to artists who have a practice that are, um, have sufficient resources, I would say, uh, and um, skill set that are able to address a, um, a complex and undefined um, set of uh, parameters as opposed to uh, an artist whose practice might be a little bit more about the making of things uh, and in this case, you're probably not, the artist is probably not going to be making anything uh, because it's going to be delivered by the, uh, a, big, a big player. Uh, and the, um, uh, the other aspect is that the, um, 
there's a, co a complexity with the interface with uh, design disciplines that it may be very unfamiliar territory for somebody who's involved in a much more uh, typical studio practice. So that's, there's a, a trope in, in, inherent, I think, of bringing an artist in early as to which artists are available for that. So I'm going to turn, uh, I have two, I think, hot mics here, uh, and I will uh, open up the, uh, open up questions to the floor, and as much as we presented very, I think, fairly specific information, I don't think that there will be any issues if we want to um, stretch the content based on your question. So does anybody want to leave that off? And if not, I'll, I'll point to somebody. Mark, thank you. Is that on? Yeah, I think so. Um, I'm interested in how the artist tailors a concept to the budget. Like given, especially in the P3 process, there's a fixed budget that you're meant to be <laughs> designing to. Um, the concepts, a lot of them are very complex and wonderful and fuzzy <laughs> early on, right? Like it must take quite a while before you get to detailed enough drawings that Project Co can even guess at how much that's going to cost. And so I'm wondering what sort of flexibility the artist and Project Co have to have um, about answering that question, like is the concept too rich for our budget? Because it may take months to work out how much it costs. So I imagine that, is that addressed to Paul uh, to start? Okay. Yeah. Do you want Ah, um, that is uh, a good question and a big problem and challenge and um, I hardly even know what to say about it except um, um, uh, it's been the source of um, tremendous concern, in brackets, stress, um, during processes, um, the kind of guesswork as to where you stand in the budget and what has helped is when in my case, accidentally, the work has some degree of scalability. In the case of a panelized fence, take away 10% of whatever panels, take away 10% of the budget. It makes it a lot easier. Um, uh, in the case of atmospheric lens, um, uh, you know, it actually reached a crisis point where we had to call everyone into a room for a, for a you know, troubleshooting meeting to brainstorm what was going to happen, um, which involved some creative uh, reworking of uh, materials and detailing. Um, um, it sure was a lot easier with something like Mirage, where I could just make kind of, uh, you know, un unofficial phone calls to suppliers, fabricators all over, till I, we could just kind of get a feel for it, based on my ability to work with them, hammering out the details without it being part of a tender and contract, pro, you know, transparent kind of process, it really made it easier. Um, uh, yeah, it's a challenge and I think the schedule has to allow for it and that's, that's part of the challenge too because you need a little time to work that out, especially if there's a degree of innovation. Uh, Laura, from a, from a sponsor's perspective, from the client, um, how do you address uh, art budgets and the, the challenges of dealing with a fixed budget. Yeah, as Martha so, said. So on our AFP projects, the artwork budgets are firm. There's no variability in them whatsoever. Um, and we lock that into the project agreement. So Project Co. also knows that they're not dipping into pocket to pay for art expenses. They know that it's a, a separate line item that they don't have to worry about. They just have to carry it. Um, and for the artist, when we're giving them the package um, and inviting them to develop a proposal for us, we tell them what the budget is. And we tell them what the budget has to contain in terms of line items. So that includes their fees, professional services they may engage, materials, transportation to site, taxes and insurances, um, installation, labor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's an all-inclusive budget. We also tell them what's excluded. 
Um, and we give artists typically about three months to develop their concepts, and we, um, we expect that they will go and engage fabricators and start to get quotations. And we encourage multiple quotations so they get a real sense. So they start with their idea, and each artist has their own process, but essentially they're going out to the field, engaging professionals, and then finding out how much these ideas cost and modifying as necessary. Because what we do in the end, if we accept a proposal, we assume that the artist has done their due diligence and costed the project effectively. If they have not, the risk is on them and the cost is on them because we lock them into the deliverable of the artwork concept. They have to realize that whatever the price may change. So we encourage contingencies. And hence the stress for yeah. the artist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. We encourage contingencies. In fact, I don't think we would pass a project that didn't have a healthy contingency, but um, the artist has to do the work. Have you found that that works? So far, yes. And, and the scalability right, strategy must help. Um, yeah, so the, um, an example, the, the second project that I showed you at Kennedy Station, which is the mentor candidate, had, had a budget of 250000 So one of the ways that she had to deal with scalability was on the light uh, panels, like the kind of um, the light boxes that she created. The number of light boxes, the dimensions of the light boxes, those affected price, and she did reduce from her initial concept in order to bring herself in under budget. Do you want to Yeah. I, she spoke about that of the P3, which has a very fixed budget. For Finch West, for instance, it was 1% of the total cost. And that cost was evaluated during the project, so it could vary. At some point, uh, in order to calculate this, we took out the extra concrete, like considering just one straight column, we thought of these capitals um, and calculated how much concrete and if it was going to fit the one point uh, something that was allocated to the art budget. Um, but again, he was very much part of our, so that how he calculated the budget and how it was was more, um, there was not so much of a hard line as it is on a P3 project. And Danielle and Neo, if you want to add anything, let me know in terms of the Ottawa experience. We worked where the artist had their own budget and the architecture had its own budget. But in cases where the artist was coming in and being a bit more integrated, where they were taking over something that the architect would have to install. Um, one example was for Parliament Station. We, had, we were working with Douglas Copeland, who is a very well-known artist, and he was very professional the whole way through. He decided that he was going to take over the scope of the... Uh, the ceiling within our entire concourse level. Throughout the project, we threw curveballs at him, and he was very receptive, and his, him and his team were very professional in solving those problems. And then just recently, we threw a massive curveball at him, and he ended up having to do a complete redesign. So even the most professional of artists, well, you can see the stress come in on them, and he ended up having to abandon, abandon the ceiling altogether. Um, and what happened in that case is that what um, you were talking about the delta. So the artist has their budget, the uh, architecture has its own budget, and because he was using the ceiling space, he got this delta, this extra, what it would cost for the construction team to install the ceiling, he got that as part of his budget. It shifted over to him. So in the process of sort of value engineering, the budget for that ceiling on the architecture side got reduced. Therefore, his delta got reduced, and he could no longer afford to do the scope of the ceiling that he was hoping to do. So, I mean, in that way, it really sort of, everything shifted. He had several options where he could reduce the size of what he was doing. Um, and he chose to completely move in a separate direction. He said, what I was planning on doing was so dependent on the size and the scope that he uh, abandoned that area and has chosen to take on another area completely. So I think it depends on how receptive the artist is and how willing they are to sort of shift uh, their mindset and say, you know what, let's get rid of it. Let's step aside from this and we'll move on. And we're going to take the budget that we have now and, uh, and rework. So. So, uh, Mark, I think that uh, there is uh, scalability is important. 
uh, then there's a breaking point. Uh, and, and we just heard of a circumstance where you have a, a, a dexterous and creative team that is able to respond to, um, uh, even though uh, P3 is pretty much set, there is a tremendous amount of change, as you well know, in the design development and the process engineering or the, uh, uh, what do you, we call it, the, uh, you know, the cheapening of the project. Inevitably, the artwork is going to get affected to a certain degree, and there is some flexibility in the artwork until you hit a breaking point and it no longer works or functions uh, as an artwork. There's another part of this whole question about uh, cost control that requires, I think, a fairly rigorous and, um, uh, and detailed uh, costing that is responsible, as opposed to uh, a non-invested um, series of quotes that come back from fabricators who may have been pre-qualified for a project, but have no real vested interest in pricing. So it's a lot of work to price something accurately. And when you give somebody something at a conceptual level, and they will give you a, um, you know, a, a mag cost of magnitude, uh, uh, order of magnitude costing, that's one thing. As you develop this, there needs to be some accountability or some level of accuracy in the costs that are being given. Otherwise, you have a project that comes in multiples over budget, and you're wondering how that, how that happened. So. Thanks for the question. Uh, does anybody else have a question? This one right here, Danielle, can you pass the mic, please? Uh, oh, actually, yes. following uh, what you just said, um, wow. that this, this is loud. <laughs> uh, because of the change of uh, scope of uh, the public art uh, that is dealing with, will we still stick to the 1% of the cost is talking about, or is actually increased the amount? The one percent um, I wasn't involved with for the Ottawa project um, in terms of determining each artist's budget, so I'm not sure where the value of their budget came from. Uh, the one percent was yeah. The one percent is for the f traditional project. That's that's a mandate from the city. For for a P3 project, it works different. So there's no limit. It's at least no 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 one no, percent, or it can be higher. Yeah, the, it depends. Like as she was talking, the, the artist is assigned a budget. Yeah, because what my concern is because it's public art, it's public structures, and people will question about where the dollars go. Um, just like building hospitals or building. Of course, architects, yeah, well, everyone right. involved in a transit station, it, we're dealing with taxpayers' money, and it's a huge responsibility for everyone, absolutely. Yeah, so. Um, we talk about, uh, let's say, 1% uh, of the um, cost goes to public art, uh, but how about the maintenance of the piece of art like for long years, as you said, right? It is not only 10, 20 years, it's actually 30 or even longer. Um, I just want to go back to your earlier point about the 1% and public spending. So the overall total budget for our work on the Ellington Crosstown was 10 million, all inclusive. And that was based on 1% of eligible capital construction public facing cost. In terms of total project cost, it was 0.001%. I'm sure if you looked at any other item on that project, glazing, tile, you would have spent more. Um, in terms of maintenance, I don't know how other programs do it, um, but we uh, reserve the maintenance 10% of the artwork budget. So there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of deletion, right? So we get our budget and then we tend to uh, remove 10% and put it in a reserve for long-term maintenance. So that's restoration repair. We also take off our procurement costs and we sometimes, on larger projects, we also hold our own contingency. Then what's left is what goes to the artist to figure out and then they do their own breakdown. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Brad. Uh, everything has come back to cost. In my life as an architect, and often as a technical advisor, and having to budget these things, this becomes a primary concern. In my life as an artist, and for many of those here in the room, at what point are we only talking dollars and cents? Whether they're it, and it was very well explained, the establishment of budgets, the legislation, the carry forward in terms of uh, insurance costs, maintenance costs. How about the art? Where, at what point does the artist still maintain a critical position, a creative expression, speaking to issues not merely to make more pleasant, so to speak, a transit station, but 
to say, what are the fundamental values of those of us, the citizenry, the community that uses these places? Because nowhere in the presentation, perhaps uh, Paul leaned a little bit to it, maybe I've known him too long, and or actually Brad, I may have known you longer. But uh, could we perhaps return to the art, and not so much the public art, but art in the public sector, and what is the responsibility as artists and as creative individuals? Yeah. So, um, David, I'm going to respond, uh, and then I'll turn it over to the um, to, to the panel. Uh, the, the first of all, there was a, the the topic this evening was directed very much in terms of a, a, a practical delivery of without delivering content, and that's why I showed the the three slides there of the controversy of what of what content was. It's a it's, it's a different issue. Now, I'm going to address it. I'm not going to uh, sidestep it. What you're talking about is uh, criticality in public art or criticality in, in art in public space. Consider this. Consider that the, that the world that we're building an artwork for today is not the uh, world that we're, going to be uh, that we're going to be reviewing that artwork 50 years from now or let's say 100 years from now. There is, by virtue of the longevity and the permanence of an artwork, we're not talking about a gallery show and we're not talking about a temporary show. There is, by virtue, of longevity, a, I would say, a, a moderation of, of expression. Uh, it is also very difficult to have a very specific discussion to a very broad public audience. Now, of course it's a, of course it's a challenge. Yeah, so this, these are permanent, so the issue is that you're looking for something through a system that is not set up to deliver criticality in public art. What we're talking about now are uh, capital projects uh, delivered with public dollars. But here is where here is where the current system and the system that we, we have in place delivers what I would call artistic excellence, what you're calling criticality. Uh, artistic excellence is defined by, and we rely on a jury system. We have a jury, these artworks are not selected by the client and they're not selected by, uh, an anonymously. There are professional juries who are uh, formed for each of the selection processes that in the case of a, of a delivery of an artwork concept, they will adjudicate. There's a competitive process and the jury is charged with the responsibility of selecting the most excellent uh, artwork, the, art, the artwork with the greatest artistic excellence. Whether that involves criticality, whether it involves specific placemaking, that is the topmost priority to the extent of 80, 90 percent, if there's a ranking criteria, of what artists are responding to and what artworks are selected for. And it is that ju ju jury system, selection panel system, that we rely on to deliver excellence. And that is the way it is. So, uh, the, we're talking about... I don't think so. I, de I dealt with your issue uh, directly. Um, I, I don't think that we can monopolize this for a discussion uh, later, and it is a much larger discussion about uh, criticality in public space and public art. I don't think there's any dancing at all. I, I think that was a little flip, frankly. I think that what we're talking about is that we invest in an adjudication system of art experts who are well-versed in the field, and that is the, that's the system that we have. If you want to propose an alternative system, uh, you know, do it, because we need, please do, because uh, the jury system is only one way, uh, it is a, it's a, a heavily relied upon way, and there's a great investment in the uh, adjudication process, and, and should be. Um, I'm, I'm someone who believes in the value and the power of art, and I've dedicated my life to working in the field. Um, the system that we have in terms of capital infrastructure projects and the 1% allocation is uh, tricky for artists to navigate. Um, there's also a number of public and political pressures that come to bear. Um, it, you also have to think about when you're producing something for the broad public, not just tomorrow, but 10 years from now, 50 years from now, who's going to be watching it, what is the context, and how do you make that appropriate? Not to make it safe you know, necessarily or to dumb it down, but how do you make sure that you're responding to that context appropriately? 
Um, one of the things that I try to do is um, actually broaden the pool of artists who can respond to projects like this and build capacity within the field. I think that provides a diversity of voices that isn't always there. Um, whether those artists uh, rise to the challenge and bring us a really sort of thoughtful and critical work, working within the very um, strict constraints of a project like this, you know, it, it's a we see every time we get the proposals, but we try to create an environment that encourages that. Does anybody else want to contribute to this particular um, discussion? There's a microphone right here. Or, or, or feel free to, um, to oh, go elsewhere. It's an interesting segue. My name is Anjali. I work for a public art organization called the Steps Initiative. Um, and our focus is uh, community engaged public art. So we've done several very large scale projects across the city. Um, and we've had the pleasure of actually working with Metrolinx to do some temporary pieces on along the hoarding of uh, the sites. Um, and I was wondering whether within your guys' practice, what, there's a consideration for a degree of community engagement in the process of creating the public art uh, projects that both you as, a, as an artist and as architects and practitioners. In our case, we hold open houses, so people are aware of the artist, um, amongst other aspects of the station, and uh, we present a fully developed model uh, with an artist concept. On so uh, we present it at different stages of the project. So that's one way we deal with community involvement. So we do something a little bit different um, on our projects is um, there's usually very early stage community and stakeholder consultation that includes working with municipalities but also community residents. Um, and one of the reasons that we do this is because we get asked frequently whether the community residents can vote on the artwork and if they can pick it. And they're used to that model because of temporary mural initiatives, which are great, um, but it com follows a completely different process than a, a permanent integrated work does. Um, so one of the things we do involving uh, sort of community groups is getting community context from them and history about the site. And we build that into the RFP that the artist responds to and in the evaluation criteria on the artwork, that is one of the key criteria that we're looking at. So we're looking at technical measures, aesthetic measures, but also sensitivity to context and whether they've really understood the brief properly. Um, so that's a way of kind of um, involving the community, uh, sussing out what those key issues are for them, and then building it in at an early stage so that however the artists choose to respond in their proposals, they've picked up on that in some way, so it's evident in the end result. Did that address your question? Yeah, I, we actually use, uh, with some of our projects, a similar approach to what you use with Metrolinx. Um, sometimes it's simply not possible to have people actually participating in, in the creation of a piece, but to to respond to what community members have provided is, is a model that we employ as well. We have time, time at least for one more question. Just um, taking on that last point and scaling it up a level, is there more that needs to be done and that can be done in selling, promoting the value of architecture and art at a, at a higher level? So I, I'm one of the non-architects in the room. So I'm thinking, I'm an accountant. And you can, can't, what's more boring than accountancy for most people? But as a, the bodies both in Canada and in the UK, they invest a lot of money promoting the value of accountants and accountancy both to the government and to the public. And I wonder, to me it's, my wife's an architect, so to me it's, it's a no-brainer on the value, but I don't see it in front of me um, on the screen, on the, on the billboards, in the magazines, unless you're choosing to go to those places, which tend to be very inward focused to your immediate stakeholder groups. But to people like the guy in the street who's walking through these places, and maybe it's just me, and maybe I'm naive and not educated enough, but I feel disconnected from that. You know, and I think it's, at least living downtown Toronto with OCAD, with just, just walking down the streets, it's there, but it's not connected up. And I wonder where more could be done, whether more could be done at scale through your professional bodies 
um, art or architecture to to really sell that. Do you mind if I can I? Um, so I I, I hear I, there, there's two two um, two aspects to your to your query. Uh, the first is that the delivery of the value of the uh, art or the architecture in these stations um, is in the, in in them themselves. The images that you saw of the TYSSE station uh, stations that were presented tonight are, uh, I would argue, especially when you go see them, or for example, the Jubilee Line extension in, in the UK, those are qualitatively uh, different spaces than a, uh, let's call it a concrete box. So the benefit is inherent in the experience that one derives in participating in, in, a, in a world that is designed and is elevated to the extent that it's beyond the bottom line delivery of either housing or transit or moving people from space to space. It is a, uh, and by the way, that's a, a huge shift. There w they, at one time, the TTC uh, was interested in delivering the most efficient way to, to move people through space and weren't that interested in um, artistic or architectural expression or design. Uh, and then it, it, it will depend. There's a huge uh, political question that does dovetail into the whole, uh, to, to the question about content and about artistic expression. So I'm going to suggest that you are, you are not, you are, excuse me, you are receiving the benefits of good design in the cities and the spaces that you, that you participate in. The second part of the question, the way that I heard it, a response, uh, is, uh, is of course, there could be a, the, the level of discourse uh, of design and design excellence can always be elevated. I'm sure you visited in, in Europe and if you stand and look at a building, you will inevitably have a discussion about architecture. It is about, it's about the, um, it's about culture, it's about the maturity of culture, it's about the acceptance of culture, and it has to do a lot with economics and, and politics. I will say, for example, that what you hear usually are the loudest voices in opposition. I showed you uh, two Calgary projects, uh, the Blue Ring project and a recently um, released uh, uh, Towers project. What you are going to hear is controversy and pushback uh, about dollars being spent. That's what you will hear. So the accountability is usually in the distillation of value or lack thereof, uh, and that it is part of the discussion, and there needs to be, of course, um, and an elevated voice, and I think that TSA and other other um, entities, professional entities, are participating to a certain degree in that. If you were in the city uh, 10, 20 years ago, the level of discourse of, of design and design excellence and the um, quality, not the quality, uh, but just the the expression of built uh, form was was much different and much less evident than it is now. The uh, market demands. Uh, for probably first and foremost are, are, are forcing uh, design and de design excellence to, um, uh, to come up. And I think that a general level of discourse and international um, uh, discussion uh, as to where a city sits uh, contributes to raising that bar. Uh, so it, it's there uh, and it needs to, we, do, we don't, um, we do, in our major um, dailies, if there are such a thing anymore, there, it's true, there isn't a, a huge discussion about uh, design, art, and architecture. They are reserved largely for trade publications, but it's, it's, it's there, it's, it's improving, and there's room for improvement. I love your question, and I thank you for asking it. Um, I think Toronto the Good has a kind of cultural expectation of pragmatism. <laughs> Um, and that's reflective in projects and it's often an uphill battle. To, uh, you have to justify the value that we're bringing to projects. Um, it's never an assumed, it's always a fight. Um, that said, you've encouraged me to go to representational, organizational bodies and kind of push them on this issue again. Yeah, just to echo what they said, we're in a very exciting time. 10, 20 years ago, you wouldn't see this, but also uh, as an architect, you're, you, you, it, it's a given you have to work with an artist and for these public facilities, even more. And also things like sustainability. So, and, and it's this shift in Toronto, you will see it more and more on, on this, this design excellence on, on public realm in general. Um, I think the question is mostly about advocacy and um, 
I'm sort of far away from that end of things, but I, I'd like to make two comments, which is um, not just in Toronto, but I've been um, um, volunteered to take interviews on talk radio where the value of my own work has been questioned uh, by taxpayers. And so um, when I've had a chance to sort of drop the gloves and spar live on, say, Saskatchewan radio, um, I've enjoyed the challenge um, and trying to articulate it. And I find that the message is incredibly easily and well received, contrary to what you might think, by what might seem like the most unlikely and hostile audiences when someone just speaks to it. Um, and then I'd also like to say that um, uh, this extension to the Spadine line, we saw two stations today, uh, is about to open and it's a great opportunity for advocacy um, and I hope the powers that be, whatever they are, uh, take advantage of it. There was one time, uh, at some point, someone found some plain renderings of uh, the station I just presented. And there was this backlash and all these comments that ETC started to receive. But why are we not getting the station you told with colors and all that? And it was really interesting for me to see that response that sometimes people complain about those superficial um, ornaments or uh, additions. And, and all of a sudden, it wasn't there. And people were complaining about it. That was, that was also an interesting sign. So I do want to wrap up. Uh, nobody's running away. I'm certainly not. If, if anybody wants to have uh, further discussion uh, it, it, about anything, um, but I, in, in wrapping up, um, I will ask each of the panelists if they, if there's maybe a, a, a lesson or a something that a little bit of advice to practitioners based on your experience, maybe some uh, kernel of wisdom that you've learned that you that you can share. There may be or there may not be. Ask questions, <laughs> even the ones you don't think are worth asking. As I said, be flexible and open on working with another creative input. Um, I think any good collaboration, including collaborations amongst artists and um, uh, design professionals and other professionals in the construction industry, um, obviously depends on good communication, but has to be underpinned um, by genuine mutual uh, respect. So thanks. Uh, just as a, as a wrap, uh, obviously we can't cover everything. There's a, it's a huge and fascinating and very interesting and evolving field. So we took a slice uh, today with a, um, an understanding of, of a particular focus. Uh, the discussion is much broader uh, based on uh, David's questions, based on the, the initial slides. There is a lot of it's a lot of interesting ideas here, a lot of content, and what's wonderful about it is that uh, it's in our world, it's in our space. So thanks for coming tonight. Uh, we will be around if anybody has any more questions or want to engage in further discussion, and hopefully we will see uh, more and more uh, public art, some good, some bad, and some excellent uh, in, in our public space. So thanks again for coming out. I wanted to thank Brad and our panelists for their insights and their time tonight and uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you so much.